Good morning, everybody. If you'd like to have a seat, we're going to start with a worship song. You might notice today that things are a little bit different. There's a few people missing behind me that are usually here with their guitars and their keyboard. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a worship band today. Um, there's a few people on holiday, and everybody we called was also away. So we've got some recorded worship that we're going to be using, but we're not going to let that hinder what God's going to do. Um, so we're going to have a really good morning. We've got two great speakers today. We've got Carissa and we've got Carolyn. And then after they've spoken, we're also going to take communion and have a little bit more worship and a time of ministry. So if you want to stand, we're just going to sing our first song. Lovely. If you want to just take your seats for a moment or two, we're just going to uh, take, have some notices. So, um, so good to see you this morning. Uh, if you're new today, as you can see, it's a bit unorthodox this morning. It's not normal, uh, but we are going to focus on Jesus this morning. Uh, some notices on the 5th of November at 10 a.m., at the Lemon next to the Pie uh, near Boston Tea Party, we are having a men's uh, breakfast. 
So if you are interested in coming along, getting to know some of the guys at church, uh, please come along for the men's breakfast. Uh, If you're new to church and you would like to find out a little bit more about Coastal Community Church, uh, we have got a welcome lunch uh, here, Sunday the 21st, after the service. All you need to do is fill out one of the Connect cards and we'll be in touch uh, and then you can come and find out a little bit more about the church. Uh, we'll share a little bit of the vision in a very, very informal lunch, uh, but also give you the chance to ask any questions, uh, any questions at all uh, that you are that you uh, have. Uh, if you would like to serve, uh, we would love to get people more involved with the church. Uh, it's a great way to find a bit of the sense of what God wants to do in your life is is to serve in your local church. So please, if you're interested in getting involved with it, be the children's work, we would love another person to help with the children's work, whether it's with the media, coffee, hospitality, uh, whether it will be even singing uh, or playing an instrument, we would love uh, for people to be more involved. So if you would like to get involved with uh, Coastal Community Church, uh, please speak to us. After the service, uh, we've got some amazing children's teams at work as they do an amazing job week after week uh, with our young people. Uh, So today uh, we haven't got Navigate, which is our youth, but what we do have is for the uh, five to eight, we have got Explore uh, with the wonderful Emma and with the wonderful Linda. And they're going to go over uh, around about 11 o'clock to the Annex. Uh, and if you can collect your children about 10 to 12. And we have also got the equally wonderful Becky, who's going to be with our little fish, which is our nought to fours, and they're going to be at the back there. All our children's team have got their purple T-shirts, but they just do an amazing, amazing job. Uh, So thank you so much to them. Now you will see on your seat, uh, you will see a leaflet, a red leaflet. And the red leaflet is for something called Samaritan's Purse. Now, we are so blessed in the West, and so often we see things through a very Western approach, but there'll be many children, not only in Barnstable, but around the world, who won't, won't get presents this Christmas. And that is just a sad fact. But we uh, want to do something to help families who won't be able to afford Christmas presents this Christmas. So, on the 14th of November, we are going to be packing in children's church, we're going to be packing shoe boxes of gifts uh, for children that won't get presents this Christmas. So please take away the leaflet, have a really good read of the things that you can and can't put in the box, and then please start bringing uh, from next week uh, gifts that we can collect. So on the 14th of November, we're going to pack those boxes. We're also going to do it in connect groups as well, so we're going to ask each connect group also to do two boxes for us. Uh, you are going to make a tremendous difference. You imagine on Christmas Day for those children that they can open up some presents. You imagine the parents being able to, the dignity of being able to give some children, their children, Christmas presents. It will be an amazing thing. Uh, So thank you very much for that. And we've got a short video just to show you a little bit more. The children are completely overjoyed. It's a real celebration. So many smiles on their faces. Smiles are all over. Yeah, yeah these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. Kids are so excited. Wow. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' wow. name. That's what this is all about. Wow. Operation Christmas Child is about expressing the love of God. It's its wonderful way to enter into the Christmas spirit in its true meaning. Operation Christmas Child has grown hugely over 30 years since it started here in Britain, but now it is a worldwide project to send millions of shoeboxes all over the world. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. So the shoebox journey essentially starts from people in their home packing shoeboxes full of essential items like a toothbrush, some school supplies. Toys and gifts, hygiene items, so there's a real mix. I love choosing the things to go in a shoebox. I like to think about what a child would enjoy receiving. Father, we commit these boxes to you as they start their journey. It's so encouraging having people coming into the church, bringing their boxes. 
All sorts of people can help with Operation Christmas Child. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. The volunteers lovingly check and prepare shoeboxes for international shipping. Everybody out there who packs shoeboxes, they are spreading God's love. Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world. And that is only the beginning. So when the children have got their boxes, they are invited to take part in something called The Greatest Journey. Which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes The Greatest Journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, it makes everything new. Operation Christmas Child opens doors for people to discover what is the greatest gift of all, the love of God through Jesus. It is impacting children, it is impacting families, it is impacting the world greatly. I really encourage you to pack a shoebox and get involved with Operation Christmas Child. Lives are being changed. All over the world, it's brilliant. just amazing you imagine on christmas day that you could make absolutely make somebody's day somewhere else in the world what an amazing amazing thing to do just going to invite uh, abe just to, to the front just for a moment or two can we just give abe a big round of applause So Abe, um, just tell me about how you were feeling uh, pre a few weeks ago. Was it last? Did it start last week? Yeah. So, um, so a few weeks ago, I um, had a severe back pain, uh, kind of on my right side here. And Saturday night, I kind of noticed it. I was on a chair and I couldn't really um, walk up or get up and walk around. And so I kind of crawled into my bed Saturday night and. Um, I was just in a lot of pain and I couldn't really move so um, Saturday night that was two weeks ago and then Sunday morning I told Karina uh, my wife uh, I can't go to church um, I'm just gonna stay in bed all day uh, can you take the kids so um, I was pretty bad I couldn't move around I'm a pretty nimble guy I like to run around but you know I was bedridden and I just couldn't move around at all so yeah and then tell us so tell us what happened next um, yeah so uh, Karina came to church and she asked uh, the leadership here to pray for me and um, which I you know I thought was amazing so uh, she came home she told me you know Mark and the leadership here and everybody prayed for for you uh, at church so um, but I she when she came home and told me that um, I was still in bed I couldn't move around all day Sunday and I was actually making preparations on my phone for Monday morning at work uh, I work for a furniture company um, and so I lift heavy furniture all day, so having a bad back um, is not going to work for me. So I was making preparations in bed uh, for Monday morning for somebody to take my shift. And um, so I was in bed all day Sunday and uh, went to sleep. I could only stay on one side. I couldn't move around in bed at all. Um, I, I normally toss around quite a bit, so it was quite hard for me on Sunday night to go to sleep. And I woke up Sunday morning. And the pain was completely gone. It was completely healed. I could Praise get up God. in bed. Uh, yeah. Uh, normally, I, when I, I do have back pain every once in a while, and it usually takes me a couple days to get over it. It's just like a muscle. It just needs to be repaired. And so that's what I was expecting. So I was like, you know, kind of expecting to take a couple days off of work. But I got up Monday morning, and it was completely healed. I could bend over, twist, do anything, lift furniture. Nothing, nothing was different than normally. So, yeah, it was... It was amazing, praise God. Praise God, thank you. Brilliant. 
So let's stand to our feet. So today might feel unorthodox. You know, we might not have a band, which is not normal for us. We would normally have a live band. But what I want you to realise this morning is that we are not limited by our situation. I remember Andrea spoke to us a few weeks ago, to a few of us, and she said, you know, are we limiting Jesus? You know, are we limiting Jesus? And I want to say today, you know, if you pray that prayer, you know, Jesus, I don't want to limit you in my life. You know, it's such an exciting prayer to pray. We have seen people healed this week. We have seen people become Christians this week. We have seen amazing provision for homes for people who were told they had no chance of getting a home. Today, I just want you to do to fix your eyes on Jesus. It says in Hebrews 11 to 12 to fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, uh, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And it says in, in Psalm 27, you know, seek my face. And today we're just going to seek God's face. We're just going to praise Jesus because he is worth all our praise. So I'm just going to pray and then we're going to continue with our worship. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this amazing miracle. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can fix our eyes on you. Well, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are not limited by our situation or our circumstances. And we just want to praise you today. We want to praise you in spirit and in truth, Lord. We want to ex encounter you today, Lord God. And we want to pray that people won't leave this place until they've encountered you and that they will be able to sense your presence and your spirit. We thank you that you're here with us, uh, you're here with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. My 
my hope will arise and death is defeated the king is alive mm. sing a little louder sing a little louder sing a little louder sing a little louder I'm sing a little louder
to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Now resurrected King has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified Forever He is lifted high Forever He is risen He is alive
place, oh God. In the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you because i want to know you more in the secret in the secret in the quiet place in the stillness you are there in the secret in the quiet hour i wait only for you cause I want to know you more cause I want to know you cause I want to hear your voice I want to know you more cause I want to touch you and I want to see I want to know you more. I am reaching for the highest goal that I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pushing every hand just aside, move out of my way. Cause I want to know you. So much more, Lord, cause I want to know you, cause I want to hear your own voice, I want to know you more, cause I want to touch you, cause I want to see your face, I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. So much more, so much more. Because I want to touch you. And I want to see your face. I want to know you more. I am reaching. I am reaching for the highest goal. Move out of my way Cause I want to know you more So much more Cause I want to know you Cause I want to hear your voice I want to know you more More and more Cause I want to touch you see more of your face Lord we want to feel more of your presence we want to see more of your breakthrough in our lives Lord 
pray, Lord, today, Lord, that we will just see more of you today. We'll feel more of you. We'll experience more of you. Lord, that we will become more like you, Lord, what you want to, what you want to do in our lives, Lord, today. Say more of you, Lord, more of your spirit, Lord, today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, if you're a child with the children, they're just going to go out with the children's team now. So Emma and Linda are going to take Explore, which is the five to eight, over to the annex. If you want to just take your seats. And if you are not to fours, they're going to go to the back with Becky. If you want to take your seats. Okay. So we have got an amazing uh, blessing for you today. We have got uh, not one speaker. We have got two people speaking today. So I'm just going to welcome to the front uh, Carissa and Carolyn. So if you just want to come to the front for a moment, we'll just pray for you both. So we are, we are continuing our series on the armour of God. And um, so Carissa is going to speak first and then we're going to welcome up Carolyn. But we're just going to pray for them. Uh, so uh, somebody once said that, uh, you know, honour doesn't sit. It either kneels or it stands. So if you just wouldn't mind just standing to your feet one more time. And we're just going to pray uh, for Carissa and Carolyn. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for the, for the gift Lord, that you are fanning into flames uh, in Carissa and Carolyn's life. Lord, we just want to pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word. Uh, Lord, just to unfold the scriptures, Lord, to speak truth into our lives. Because, Lord, we want to see breakthroughs today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, take your seat, Carissa. Good morning. So I'm not usually used to being up here. I'm usually making the coffee or saying hello on the door. So I'm, it's going to be a, a small talk um, on the helmet of salvation. And we've been doing this series in our church on the armour of God. And this week we're going to just go back to the key passage that we've been looking at in Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and, done ha and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So what is the helmet of salvation? And why is this piece of the armour so crucial to us on the spiritual battlefield? Well, we find the answer in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 8 to 9. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to abstain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse, as a helmet the hope of salvation, clarifies for us that the helmet of salvation is not in reference to attaining salvation, because the armour is given to Christians, those who are already saved to wear. The helmet of salvation is in reference to our future hope of eternal life. 
R.C. Sproul, one of my favourite preachers, says this about hope. Hope is called the anchor of the soul because it gives stability to the Christian life. But hope is not simply a wish. I wish that such and such would take place. Rather, it is that which latches on to the certainty of the promises, the future hope that God has given us. So when the helmet of salvation is firmly on our heads on the battlefield, it means we are standing with the uttermost confidence in God that what he has promised to us in his word concerning our salvation, our eternal life will absolutely come to pass. We are to be fully assured of our salvation now and of our hope of eternal life that Christ has paid for in full with his blood. So why is the hope of our salvation a piece of the armour in spiritual warfare? In the film, Saving Private Ryan, there is a scene in which a soldier is hit by a bullet in his helmet. So he takes it off to examine the bullet, and while his head is left exposed and without the protection of the helmet, the enemy seizes the opportunity and fires the gun straight at his head, which kills him. A helmet is for protection, it protects the head. And what the enemy seeks to do, like the soldier in the Private Ryan film, is to get us to take off our helmet. Because once we do, we become dangerous, dangerously vulnerable and exposed to his flaming arrows. Because the helmet is the helmet of salvation, what the enemy does to get us to take it off and examine it, which would leave our minds exposed, is to attack us with doubt and discouragement regarding whether we are actually truly saved. You see, the enemy is a strategist. The enemy uses insidious, deceptive tactics to try to disarm us. Ephesians 6, verses 7 says, Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. In our Connect group this week, Trish said something so true, that one of the tactics of the enemy is to take something that has some modicum of truth to it and then uses that very thing to get our attention. The enemy will use past and present failings and sin as his ammunition to cause us to have doubt and discouragement. He will use our weakness and if we have wrong beliefs about ourselves and have an incorrect view of God, he will also use those. The enemy will take areas where we have been deeply wounded, which have led to wrong beliefs about ourselves and given us an incorrect view of who God truly is as our loving Heavenly Father and uses that as ammunition in his gun of discouragement and doubt. The enemy will say things to you like this. If you're really saved, you wouldn't have committed that sin. If you're really saved, you wouldn't still be struggling with that sin. You have lost your salvation. Do you really think that God loves you? You are worthless and he will not save you. And this is just a few examples of the things the enemy will say to cause us to doubt. And there are many different ones he will use because he will use things personal to us because that is the depth of his cunning and all of it is absolute deception. Jesus said this about the enemy in John 8, verses 44, that he is a liar and the father of lies. Many years ago, I went for a period of time being assailed by doubts from the enemy about my salvation. The enemy had taken a truth in my life, the truth being that during a past season in which I was backslidden from God and walked on a path of sin, and using this, the enemy had, and even though I had fully repented, the enemy bombarded my mind with these thoughts. If you were really a Christian you, and you were really saved, you would not have backslidden and you would not have committed that sin. And the enemy would say things to me like, do you honestly think that God can forgive you for that? What this did to me spiritually, because I was be believing the lies, was catastrophic. I was so distracted all the time by these thoughts that I had become ineffective in my walk with God. I lost the joy of my salvation where I had previously walked in the knowledge of the love and forgiveness and mercy of God on my life and now felt fearful. And I felt like I had lost all my spiritual strength. Amid this attack, God spoke to me and reminded me what the Bible says about the enemy. Revelation 12 verses 10 says that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. And that is exactly what it felt like, that I was being accused constantly, under condemnation, and it was difficult to bear. 
And then God said something to me that totally and utterly in that moment caused my joy and my strength and my hope to return. God said this to me, is Jesus' blood not sufficient for your sin? And all I could say to God in the absolute truth from my heart was that Jesus' blood is sufficient for my sin. You see, the enemy cannot argue with the power of that truth. So back on when my, went on, so back on went my helmet, that's the hope of my salvation, and out came the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and out of my mouth I quoted to the enemy a verse such as Ephesians 1, verses 7. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then what happened to me next is what James 4, 7 says. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Knowing that we are saved with our helmet of salvation firmly in place gives us spiritual stability because our hope is the anchor for our soul. That hope is so powerful in the life of a Christian, it gives us strength. And on the battlefield, we need strength. And that is why God has given us this helmet, the hope of our salvation, as a piece of the spiritual armor. The enemy will, at some point in the Christian life, attack you with thoughts of doubt and discouragement about your salvation. Ben said in last week's message on the shield of faith that when we are in a war, we cannot stop the enemy firing shots, but those shots don't need to take us down. And I just want to finish by saying that for us to overcome the enemy when he comes with his fiery arrows of doubt and discouragement is to know and meditate on the truth of God's word, to understand what Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection has fully accomplished for us and the wonderful eternal promises that we have been given. Because when we do, our swords are sharpened, our hope is firmly in place. Let us not take off our helmets and examining them by questioning our salvation when the enemy comes with his doubts and lies. Let us keep it firmly on our heads. Thank you. Hi, my name's Carolyn, and um, today, I might not be tall enough, <laughs> this one, like that. that's a bit better, <laughs> so um, today I'm going to talk about my experience um, when I'm at work, and when I've needed the full armour of God, I'm a hairdresser, so I work in a really busy salon, and I'm the only Christian where I work. And when I first became a Christian, I found it hard trying not to let things affect my heart. I would try and distance myself from my work colleagues by sitting in another room while I was on my break and reading my Bible. I thought perhaps I was now in the wrong job and that maybe I would be better off leaving and doing something else. But over time, I realized I was in exactly the right place, a place where God would want me to be. I could be the light in the darkness. The armor of God reminds me as a Christian about the reality of the spiritual battle. The Bible tells us that we are fighting a war against Satan who seeks to destroy us. When I first learned about this spiritual battle, I didn't really, really believe it happened. But the more I studied the word, the more I realized how true it was. I work with some very interesting people. They are funny, kind, and at some times a little bit crazy. It's surprising though that even if they had told me they don't believe in God, I have been asked to pray for them, especially when they were having a tough time. I know that if I didn't read my Bible daily, I would be affected. We all have a flesh, and it's easy to be drawn into things. I would say where I work, people like to gossip. Gossip is contagious, and it's one of the best strategies the enemy uses to divide us as Christians. It plays on the small and sometimes large thought we already have in our heads 
and tempts us into engaging further into discussions that only do harm to us, but also to others. No one is immune from being sucked in, especially Christians. We are just as, if not more vulnerable to, to, to engage into conversation that can quickly become hurtful to something, someone else. It is important that I avoid being pulled into it. Jesus is in our hearts and I need to be mindful of what comes out of my mouth at all times. I can't afford to let the devil get a foothold in. I pray daily for protection. I ask God that he will guard my heart and I pray whatever comes out of my mouth will be a blessing to somebody. Without prayer, I am vulnerable. Seven days without prayer makes one week, as in W-E-A-K. I once read that outside a church. It's so true. In Matthew 26, 41, it says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It is a constant battle for me being a Christian. The flesh not only includes our physical body, but also our soul. God has given us everything it takes to protect ourselves by reading the word. We can tap into the power of the Holy Spirit inside us by renewing our mind in God's word. The more our minds are renewed, the more the power of God will flow through our soul and physical body. We must exercise our soul, mind and body unto godliness. I hope and pray that my love for Jesus will shine through and they will know that Jesus is alive in me. God's word is our weapon. When the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness, it was so he could be tempted by the devil. How did Jesus respond? He answered every temptation with, it is written. The word of the Lord is the sword of the spirit and it is the only offensive spiritual weapon we have. Jesus showed us to use it. Since Jesus is the word of God, anything he would have spoken would have been the word. When he was tempted, he could have said, scat or shoe, and the devil devil would have had to go. Nevertheless, he quoted the written word of God each time. The same word you and I have today. This gives us great assurance that the written word of God is sufficient for us. Jesus, in the face of the greatest temptation Satan could offer, did not need to say anything that was not already recorded in scripture. The word sustained him and enabled him to overcome all temptation to sin. It is likely that when he returns to this earth, he will speak the written word to destroy his enemies. No wonder Satan tries to keep us from studying God's word. God has given you the mighty weapon of his word. When you speak the word in faith, hell shakes. Satan and his minions have already experienced what the word can do. They know its power. The closer we are to the shepherd, the safer we are from the wolves. I feel blessed to be able to witness to people in my work. I have to be careful though. A conversation about God does not begin with, have you been washed in the blood? If it did, I'm sure they would want to go run into the door. I was able to tell a client about my faith one time. I told her about my life and what Jesus had done. And when I asked him to come into my life, that night she went online and listened to one of the sermons at Coastal. I was sat in church the following Sunday and she walked in. She went on an alpha course at Linda and Paul's and was baptized a few months later. God, God is so good and I feel so blessed to be able to serve him and play my part in this lady's journey. I sometimes pray for people while I'm working. They don't know this, but I feel the Holy Spirit prompting me. I use arrow prayers. 
An arrow prayer helps to penetrate any fear or darkness that someone could be feeling at that time. Arrows not only give us direction and show us a way to go, they are also deadly weapons. To lift up to God as a simple and secret thought, or we can use them in the event of an emergency that occurs. The devil would like us not to use this method of prayer because he knows that these types of prayers reveal the faith in us. Arrow prayers can be shot up to heaven in a single breath and only take a second or two to pray. They are a great way to be able to pray for someone while I'm working and they don't know I'm doing it. When we don't have enough time to hit our knees and enter the presence of God, take one of these arrows from your spiritual quiver and send it flying to heaven and into the heart of Christ. I'd just like to pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for the life you have given us, and unto your hands we commit our lives. You are our protector, O Lord. Guide and protect us in all our doings. You are our refuge. Please shield us under your wings and deliver us from trouble. As we step out after church today, be with us and within us. Walk beside us, before us and behind. Please give us strength and courage. And when things go wrong, and help us to find comfort in you, knowing that you, Lord, are in control. Thank you for keeping us safe in Jesus' name. Amen. That was so good. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Carissa. Um, it's just a chance now for us to respond, and we're going to take communion today. And I think it's really appropriate for what all these both ladies just shared. You know, we're talking about the power of Jesus. We're talking about his blood. Carissa said, you know, is my blood sufficient for you? Is it sufficient to take away your sin? And obviously the answer is yes, it is. Um, and so the Last Supper is the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before he went to the cross. And this communion meal, it's just a chance for us to remember what Jesus did, to remember and share in his suffering, and also to remember that he went to the cross and to celebrate that, you know, one day he will come again. And so first we remember in 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it says that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And communion is also a time to celebrate, to celebrate what was accomplished on the cross for us, to celebrate because we're all invited to the table. And um, yeah, we're all part of, part of that family. And Jesus said, you know, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. For surely I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has a life that lasts forever. I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. The living Father sent me and I live because of him. In the same way, the one who eats me will live because of me. I am this bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the bread that your early fathers ate and they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that you went to the cross for us that you took up our sins and our infirmities on the cross and that you suffered greatly so that we can be set free, that we can be in relationship with you and that we can have that eternal life. We have the hope and the promise of that eternal life and I pray that as we take communion, you will once again establish your kingdom in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So everybody's invited. The ladies are going to come round with a tray with the bread and the juice. We've also got gluten-free option if you need that, so just ask them. Um, we're just going to put a flow of songs on, and so in your own time, just, you know, examine your own heart, forgive anyone that you need to forgive, and just take that time to pray just before you take communion. And um, we're just going to put a flow of songs up, so there'll be some worship going on, and we'll also have a team to pray as well. So if you need prayer today, if you've come and if you've been inspired by Abe's story of healing, if you've got a bad back, there's a word about a back again today. As we pray before the service, I think Ben sensed that there's someone else that has a, a bad back and that God wants to heal that today. So if you've come with a need, communion is a perfect place to, to come and to get right with God and to experience his blessings. Amen.
If you're looking for a breakthrough this morning, just start making your way over to the right hand side, to my right here. Connect group leaders, prayer team, if you can be there. But we don't want to leave this place this morning without having a breakthrough. If you've got a bad back this morning, we want to pray for you. Just sense as well if, if there's somebody here with an uncertain work situation. Uh, we want to pray for you. But if you want breakthrough this morning, if you want prayer this morning, uh, don't leave this morning without getting prayer. We're just going to carry on worshipping for a few moments longer. So carry on worshipping, but if you want prayer as well, please come and get prayer. And in around about 10 minutes, we'll be collecting the children if you've got children in the next board.
chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Lord for your amazing grace we thank you Lord that you have met with us today and we thank you for your presence I thank you for the prayers that you're answering right now Lord because of the power that's in your blood we praise you Lord and we thank you I pray Lord for everybody here that they would go out today refreshed and filled with your spirit and that yeah you would just bless their week and bless us as we go out help us to be light in this world Lord help us to be salt and light in Jesus name amen there's teas and coffees over there. If you still want prayer, feel free to come over and have some prayer. Great to see you all. Bye for now.